Hello, and welcome to In This Tent We Obey Conservation Laws. I'm Noam Bellenstein, and I'm a physicist who takes flying trapeze lessons at TSNY in Washington, D.C., which you can see in the picture on the lower left. As you might expect if you know any physicists, I've therefore been thinking about the physics of flying trapeze for a while. Recently, I was asked whether I could present something about that topic, so I put together these videos. I'm going to show you some things about the physics of flying trapeze. How do out-of-shape 40-year-olds do tricks? How better flyers gain or at least not lose any height during the swing? And even flip over while falling like a cat? This is part one where I'll talk about the basics of forces and energy in the system, and how do out-of-shape 40-year-olds do tricks. First, let me show you the parts of the system that I think about when I think about the physics of flying trapeze. There's the fly bar and lines, the flyer, and of course the safety lines holding the flyer up uh, when they fall. And there are some forces that operate on the various parts of the system. There's gravity pulling the flyer down. There are the trapeze lines, which pull the flyer up, always parallel to the lines, to keep their length fixed because they're essentially rigid. And then the safety lines, which pull the flyer more or less up, they're attached to uh, trolley and pulley right here that go back and forth uh, as the flyer is swinging. So first, in this part, I'll start with the knee hang, which is the very first trick that you learn in flying trapeze. So the first trick, the knee hang, starts from the board with the takeoff on the right side of the screen, the way I have it uh, pictured here. As the flyer swings down, they get a call to hang straight as they hit the, the bottom of the arc. And then when they reach the peak of the arc, they get a call to pull their knees up and hook them onto the bar. And you can see right here the knees are hooked on. So when you see this for the first time coming in as somebody who maybe had, did not really conceive of doing flying trapeze before, you wonder how hard is this for normal people to be able to do to execute this trick. And the answer is that rule number one is the timing is very important. And with a good timing, most people can do this trick. So standing before takeoff, you're on the board, standing still, you feel the pull of gravity, 1G pulling you down, so you feel your normal weight. At the bottom of the swing, at pulse, gravity is pulling you down and the lines are accelerating you up to keep the fixed length, to keep you rotating along the arc, the centripetal force. And so you feel a subjective weight that's more than 1G. You feel like more than your normal weight. But then at the very peak of the swing, you're almost at free fall. You feel a subjective weight that's significantly less than 1G. In fact, if you were to make it all the way up to 90 degrees past vertical to a horizontal line, you'd actually instantaneously be in complete free fall, feeling zero weight. And that's what makes it possible to do this trick more easily than it would be in other circumstances. So to try to understand this a bit more quantitatively, I put together a minimal numerical model for swinging, thinking of it as an unharmonic oscillator. So I'm thinking of a pendulum with a point mass uh, that's swinging, but I do full pendulum dynamics, not just a small angle approximation, and I solve it in Cartesian coordinates. And then I integrate the equations of motion numerically using a position verlet like integrator. Uh, there's a reference here if anybody is interested. And it's a reversible algorithm, so it's stable and produces uh, dynamics that don't have too many artifacts. And the line length, the length of the flying lines, are enforced as an exact constraint. Down here on the bottom right, I have a link to the little JavaScript program, which just generates the animations that I'll show you in a moment. I also have here, very briefly, a snapshot of the numerical integration algorithm, which I put together to solve this little problem. I'm not going to go through it in, at all, but if anybody is interested, feel free to ask me questions in the comments. So here's a video of a swing uh, integrated using this numerical model. The white dot right here is the flyer. It's a point mass. The white line are the lines connecting the, the flyer to the swinging point, the flying lines and the flying trapeze bar. These red dots mark the extrema of the swing. The red line pointing down is the instantaneous subjective weight. And the blue down pointing down is a reference 1G line, just the pull of gravity pointed straight down. And I'll start the movie. And you'll see that as the flyer is swinging back and forth, the red line changes length. At the peaks of the swing, it's small because the subjective weight is low. And at the bottom of the swing, the line is significantly larger than G, in this case about two times gravity, so the subjective weight at the bottom of the arc is closer to 2G. Now I can do the same thing for a larger swing starting at a higher angle. And as I start the movie, you can see that the line becomes even shorter close to the peaks of the swing, even closer to 0G, and then even longer at the bottom of the swing. So a larger swing involves higher velocities, and so the subjective weight at the bottom of the swing is even larger, maybe about three or four times as large as 1G in this particular case for this angle, this line length. 
And that's why the right timing makes all the difference. It's much easier to get the knees up at the peak of the swing than doing it too early, which a lot of beginners do, or too late, or for that matter on the playground on a fixed bar, even if the swing is significantly less than 90 degrees. And that's why the instructors emphasize following their directions when they give them. Of course, they do compensate for the delayed reaction, so they give the call slightly early so that you do the movement at the time that they think will make it most straightforward to achieve. And so that's the answer to how out of shape 40 year olds do flying trapeze tricks, it's timing. Now, we can look a little bit more at the energy balance in the system. So we have the flyer, the fly bar, and the lines. And in this very simple model, where we just think of the flyer as a point mass, there's a potential energy, which I label here as V, just mass times uh, acceleration of gravity times the height of the center of mass, this H, mgh. And then there's a kinetic energy term, one half mv squared, where v squared is the uh, velocity of the center of mass, if you assume that it's just a point mass. And if energy is conserved, the total energy has to be a constant. The lines, of course, do exert a force on the system, but the distance changes zero, so they don't actually do any work on the system. They just keep you constrained to moving along essentially a circle described by the radius, described by the length of the lines. So if you look at what happens to these potential and kinetic energies as the flyer is swinging, this is more or less basic thing you learn in, in introductory physics about a pendulum. You start out at a large height, zero velocity, so all of your energy is potential energy. At the bottom, the height has become smaller, you've gone down. The velocity is high, so all the energy is kinetic. There's the least possible potential energy and the maximum kinetic energy. And then as you reach the far peak of the swing, again, the height is maximum, the velocity is zero, so all the energy is back to being potential energy. And the energy sloshes back and forth between kinetic and potential as you go through the oscillation. Now, if conservation of energy were exact for the system, that would mean that no amplitude, that is to say no height, is lost over time. Of course, in real life, that energy is not conserved because it doesn't include all of the different terms that really should be included. There's certainly drag as you're whooshing through the air. Maybe that's negligible, you're not going all that fast, but there's the possibility of dissipating energy by jiggling the air around. There's friction in the fly bar and lines at the attachment points where the lines are swiveling and there's vibrations and stretching in the lines. There's definitely friction in the safety lines as the trolleys and pulleys move back and forth, you dissipate energy, and there's also vibrations and stretching in those lines. And finally, and in some ways most preventably, there's potential for dissipation in the flyer. Anytime the flyer changes shape, that energy comes from the potential plus kinetic energy that I showed earlier, so that's sucking away energy from the pendulum, and then it ends up being damped by the muscles. But anytime you lose that potential and kinetic energy that are really involved in the pendulum, you lose height, and you need height to be able to reach the catcher. So you really want to prevent that if at all possible. And that brings me to rule number two, which is to stay tight. One of the first pieces of instructions you get in class is that if you don't get any other instructions, stay tight and straight. And that's at least partially for safety reasons, but it's also definitely to help you retain as much energy in the pendulum, as much height as you can. And you'll notice very quickly that the staff and even the more advanced students are much quieter in the air, with no or at least much less wasted motion. And that's because these loose muscles lead to unnecessary motion, so the system is doing work in the physics sense, force times distance on the flyer. And then that energy in the flyer's body is then damped by the muscles, which turns it into either chemical or thermal energy and removes it from that energy expression that I wrote. So of course the total energy for the whole thing really is conserved as it must be, but the energy that's relevant to the swing is reduced when this happens. And that reduces the amplitude of the swing, reduces the height, and makes it harder to be able to reach the catch. Now out of line flyers, which is mainly staff, but also some of the more advanced students, do get to avoid the dissipation in the safety lines, because if you don't have lines, you don't have the drag of the lines, you don't have the friction and the pulleys and so on. And that is part of why they can fly so high. Of course, the technique is also important, but that does help. Hopefully I've shown you that flying trapeze is interesting as a system to understand through physics, but you should definitely remember that it's also fun and not as hard as you might think, so you should definitely go ahead and try it. I want to acknowledge the people who've helped me in this process, the TSNYDC staff who've taught me what little I know about flying trapeze, Karen Ross for help with the screen capture software, and the Caltech Alumni Association that suggested that I put this presentation together. Hi. <coughs> Hi. <coughs> <coughs> 
very, very thin at one end, much, much thicker in the middle, and thin again at the other end.